Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Melissa V. Harris Perry's Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. We are on Chapter 6, entitled God, and this segment is entitled The Struggle Within. For much of this book, I have discussed how American history, social institutions, policy initiatives, and popular culture have crafted negative images of Black women that they have, in turn, attempted to resist or accommodate in order to gain full recognition as citizens. Because the American state is represented primarily by white people and institutions, if we are not careful, it is easy to interpret the story I have told as primarily a story of racial bias that just happens to affect women a little differently from men. But this analysis of religious beliefs reaffirms that the crooked room is not just a race story, but a gender story. Black women find that they are second-class citizens even within the black church an institution composed primarily of African-Americans and operating relatively independently of white financial and political control. African-American women are not only denied full citizenship by the institutional rules of many congregations that bar their orientation or that bar their ordination. They are also denied full citizenship in the image of God. For many, God is unlike them. They are mothers, workers, friends, but God is a father, a judge, and a king. Black women may enter the church seeking the recognition denied them in the American system, but even within the church, they often find that they are valued to the extent that they remain strong, becoming a backbone on which the church can be built. In the fall of 2010, the misrecognition of black women through the distorting lens of black patriarchal forms of Christianity was evident in the much-anticipated film adaptation of Nazansky Shang's for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Earlier, I discussed how Shang's choreo poem is a definitive artistic representation of the crooked room that has been embraced by at least two generations of black women. In 2010, the poem was produced as a feature length film. The play was revised into a screenplay and then directed by Tyler Perry. Perry, a black man, is easily the most commercially successful contemporary African-American filmmaker working in Hollywood. Having started as a wildly successful writer, producer, and actor of gospel stage plays, Perry has built a success primarily on the support of Christian, African-American, female audiences who enjoy both the comedy and the moral lessons of his work. Perry's plays... Oh, one second... All right, sorry, phone was tripping. Perry's plays and films regularly center on female characters, the most popular of whom is actually Perry himself dressed as a woman, and he is a favorite artist among black female viewers, but his projects, arguably like the black church itself, are steeped in a narrow Christian moralism that idealizes benevolent male leadership. Feminist writer Courtney Young describes Perry's, quote, gender problem, end quote, writing, quote, each of his films advances nearly the same message to his audience, which is overwhelmingly African-American female, devoutly Christian and over 30. Be demure. Be strong, but not too strong. Too much ambition is a detriment to your ability to find a partner and spiritual health. Female beauty can be dangerous. Let a man be a, quote, man, end quote. True female fulfillment is found in the role of wife and or mother. To this effect, the black church plays a central role in Perry's vision, end quote. Perry's ownership of the For Colored Girls film ensured that it would be widely distributed and would attract large audiences, but it raised concerns about what would happen to Shang's original messages when filtered through Perry's lens. After all, when For Colored Girls was released in 1976, it was widely maligned and Shang was broadly vilified by African-American men who perceived the work as unnecessarily critical of embattled black men. Of this reaction, Shang writes, quote, the reaction from black men to For Colored Girls was in, a very, was in a way very much like the white reaction to black power. The body traditionally used to power and authority interpreting through their own fear, my work celebrating the self-determination and centrality of women as a hostile act, end quote. 
Shang's work is powerful in large part because of his insistence on self-determining black female characters written by a black feminist author. Shang's women are certainly not stereotypical, strong black women impervious to suffering. Her play is a direct challenge to the notion that black women's strength always trumps their anguish. Black women can and do feel the doubts, frustrations, pain, and depression that should rightfully accompany the hardships they often face. She indicts a world that leaves black women with no place to turn when the world is overwhelming and insists that black women can find comfort and even God in one another and in their authentic selves rather than in the confines of traditional church membership. Perry's film distorts Shane's work of self-determination in ways that reinforce the crooked room imposed on black women by male-centered religion and resorts to tools of shaming that so often derive from the crooked room. Although the women in Shane's original work rely on spirituality and divine support, they are not beholden to any specific definition of God. In Perry's film, the women are subjected to more dominating, moralistic, and constrained notions of morality. Perry creates a new character, played by Whoopi Goldberg, who is a religious fanatic. She serves as a tool of shaming surveillance in the film, interjecting her judgmental, mocking, dogmatic Christian ethics over Shang's original poetry. Perry also generates a homophobic storyline that does not exist in Shang's play. In this subplot, one of the women learns she is infected with HIV by her, clo- by her closeted gay husband, whose philandering is caused by the woman's neglect of the relationship in favor of pursuing success in her career. And in a particularly egregious revision of the original text, Perry conflates the Lady in Yellow monologue about sexual freedom and exploration with the Lady in Blue narrative about seeking an unsafe, illegal abortion. Feminist literary scholar Salah Shah Talet describes the violence that this revision causes to Shang's original intent. Quote, in the play, the lady in yellow delivers a lush monologue about her past experience of cruising, dancing, and losing her virginity on graduation night. In the film, these same words are now recited by a teenage girl, Nyla, played by Tessa Thompson, whose bold act of sexual possession is eventually mocked by her mother, Alice, a new new character introduced by Perry and played by Whoopi Goldberg. But even more violently, under Perry's disapproving directorial eye, Nyla is punished for her sexual curiosity. Her beautiful story of sexual awakening becomes merged with the original Lady in Blue's tale of a pre-Roe vs. Wade back alley abortion. The end result is a moralizing sermon against Black women's promiscuity and sexual agency, and more subtly, against choice itself. End quote. Tyler Perry's film adaptation of Shane's classic work, is a harrowing example of how the gaze of black men can be just as crooked as that of white Americans when viewing African-American women. African-American religious life, whether in the traditional structure of the church or in religiously infused popular culture like the work of Tyler Perry, is fraught with distorted images that can be particularly difficult for black women to navigate because it is also a space that holds such potential for emotional healing and political organizing. The church, in the broadest and most plural sense, is a site of struggle for sisters. Okay, here, let's have a reflection. I think what stands out to me, I have, I, I guess I should preface this too. I have never seen For Color Girls, uh, the movie by, the film by Tyler Perry. I've never seen the play or read the, the screen, read the stage play. And... There's been a couple of things within this book that we've read about of pieces of film or, enter- uh, I don't know if I use entertainment, but pieces of art that I have not viewed. I haven't seen Spike Lee's documentary that we read about earlier on that spoke about the flood and Hurricane Katrina, the flood and the Hurricane Katrina and the things that came after it. But I have this HBO app, which has this documentary on it, and I have downloaded it. I plan to watch that. I have seen clips of for color girls and from what i understood of what the movie was about it just felt like it was something that i wasn't that it was it just wasn't for me not because i didn't want to see black women's stories told uh but because the trailer and the promotion for it all felt very uh 
traumatizing and uh, almost exploitative. Uh, exploitative. I don't know if it, I actually I added an extra. Uh, I think I actually added an extra uh, syllable in there. Exploitative, of uh, expletive, exploitive, not expletive. All right, well, it don't matter. I'm 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 convoluting words right now and it's distracting from the statement I'm trying to make. It felt like it was an exploitation of trauma that black people experienced. And so that was the reason I didn't watch it. That has been one of my personal uh, gripes with some of Tyler Perry's film is that I does not, I don't feel that it gives a full representation of the black experience in America. I feel that it gives a uh, stereotypical, it gives a one dimensional perspective of black life in America and the black experience in America. Uh, so as I read through these things, I'm seeing most of these things here for the first time. And it's not surprising to me that Tyler Perry would create something. And in the creation of it, it would dilute or alter some of the uh, messaging that was meant to be inside of it, because that's just part of how Hollywood has worked historically when it comes to stories about black struggles, when it comes to stories about black people, when it comes to stories about black life, even when the writer may be black or the director may be black or a producer or the cast may be black, uh, the further up you go down the line or, you know, eventually you will run into white money and you will write into, run into white distributors and, and white people who are involved who do not understand the difference in creating white films or films that would be that primarily tell the stories of white people and there's films that tell the stories of black people or music that tells the stories of white people and music that tells the stories of black people. There is a distinct difference because of the experience that we have had in this uh, country. And when art is not told through that prism or not when art is not created through that prism or distributed through that prism when people don't understand that it has to be a conscious effort or a conscious decision to give a full representation of the black experience you tend to get things like what is pointed out here in, in this section about what happened with for color girls we spoke about this with different with the Uncle Tom's Cabin book when we read Women, Race, and Class about how the book, yeah, it did do the job of getting more people to understand the hordes of racism, but it also did the jobs of perpetuating some of these stereotypes, that these negative stereotypes that black people endured. And so that's just the thought that comes to mind in reading this. All right, let's keep going. Tyler Perry's film adaptation of Chang's classic work is a harrowing example of how the gaze of... Oh, I just read through that. Sorry. Okay. When Black liberation theology mounted its challenge to traditional Western theological traditions, it did so with a fierce and courageous willingness to name and refute racism. But the same tradition was nearly silent on gender. It took a second generation of liberation theologians, themselves black women, to fill in the missing testimony of black women's experiences and demand recognition within the discipline. But even as they recover black women's faith, experiences, oh, excuse me. But even as they recover black women's faith experiences as the basis for a new theological tradition, many womanists did what black women so often do. They define themselves in terms of strength. This self-image of strength resists the ugly lies of historic white racism, and it refuses to accept the silence of black male patriarchy, but it may still limit black women's ability to be fully citizens, fully vulnerable, and deserving of both recognition and support. As Nadine talked with the other black women in the Chicago focus group, she mused on the meaning of being a strong black woman. Quote, I think strength is measured by what you endure, what you have to take on. The things that have happened to me in my life, the next person may not be able to handle them. And it wasn't because I was so especially strong. I was just me and I dealt with the things as they came. With God's grace, I made it, end quote. At face value, statements like Nadine's point to the ways that religious commitments have helped black women survive the oppressive conditions they encounter in America. 
But the evidence presented in this chapter causes us to reevaluate this seductive notion that faith in God helps black women to endure and is therefore good. African-American women are profoundly religious. They use their experiences in church and their commitments to a present and loving God to motivate and direct social engagement and political action. But although black women provide much of the prophetic motivation and personal labor that makes struggle for racial liberation possible, their own needs as persons and political actors remain unmet. In 1974, the women of the Combehi River Collective asserted that the, quote, psychological toll of being a black woman and the difficulties this presents in reaching political consciousness and doing political work can never be underestimated, end quote. The evidence I have presented bears out the ongoing relevance of this statement. Even as they seek a balm in Gilead, black women embrace a Christianity that gives them the comfort to endure suffering, but fails to provide the tools to challenge patriarchy. But there is hope. Religious belief and practice have already created liberating racial reasoning and proxies for black women. They have simply failed to provide an adequately gendered analysis. With his broader divine imagination and insistence on specifically gendered understandings of God's justice, a black woman's religiosity based in the precepts of womanism might have the potential to address a wider range of black women's spiritual needs. Womanism is an approach that may offer more opportunities for accurate recognition of black women. By imagining a God more like themselves, black women might finally find a place to lay down the heavy mantle of impervious strength. Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison offers a powerful image of this religious possibility in her novel, Beloved. The novel is the complex and emotionally difficult tale that reveals the intergenerational human destruction wrought by slavery. At the heart of the story is Seed, an enslaved woman who finds her way to freedom after being physically and sexually assaulted in nearly unimaginable ways. Through Seed's experiences of infant, infanticide, haunting, grief, and shame, Morrison hints at the excruciating choices black women have had to make in order to find and preserve freedom for themselves and their families. At the head of this family is Steve's mother-in-law, baby Suggs, quote, holy, end quote. During her decades of enslavement, baby Suggs has eight children and all but one were taken away from her. Though he dies enslaved, the one child she was allowed to keep eventually purchases her freedom. Years later, when Steve escapes freedom, she flees to baby Suggs, who becomes a healing counselor for her. In one of the book's few hopeful moments, before the most awful consequences of slavery reinvade their lives, baby Suggs takes Steve to a clearing in the woods where she preaches. In Their Eyes Were Watching God, Janie's grandmother laments that she had a great sermon to preach, but no pulpit. In this novel, the black grandmother as preacher becomes a reality. Baby Suggs has founded her own church, not in a building, but in a small clearing, a hush arbor. There, Baby Suggs serves as minister ordained only by her own suffering and by her own great calling. Her words are the conduit of healing for an entire community of free blacks who are scarred by the world in which they find themselves. Rather than asking them to deny their pain or to bear it stoically in order to prove their strength, Baby Suggs encourages them to release it through song, dance, open weeping, and togetherness. She also asked the black people assembled in her clearing to embrace a new faith based on reimagining their own bodies as something beautiful and worthy of love. Quote, in this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet and grass. Love it, love it hard. Yonder they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You got to love it. You. End quote. This admonition, admonition, this admonition, this admonition to touch and love their own black flesh is Baby Sugg's womanist contribution to a religious faith that can straighten the shame-producing images of the crooked room. She points out every crooked angle, 
every hateful assumption of racism, and every policy that leaves black people unequal and vulnerable. Then she reminds black people that they retain the power of self-love to rebuke these crooked images. Baby Suggs promises that the fierce, genuine, loving acceptance Baby Suggs promises that the fierce, genuine, loving acceptance of one's own humanity is a path to freedom. Through, quote, Baby Suggs, holy, end quote, Morrison gives us a radically different image of a black preacher, and through this preacher, a genuinely new articulation of God. It is a glimpse into the possibilities represented by black women's faith. And that brings us to the end of chapter six. And what we will do is we will actually end this episode here and we will start chapter seven fresh. So that way we're not having two chapters in one episode. I've been trying to avoid that happening. And I think my last, my main takeaways from this chapter comes in this sentence and I might phrase it a little different than phrase it a little differently than it was phrased by Melissa V. Harris Perry. Mm. Even as they seek a balm in Gilead, black women embrace a Christianity that gives them the comfort to endure suffering, but fails to provide the tools to challenge patriarchy. And that is something that that sentence there far too often what we have seen for black people, black women uniquely and specifically in what we're reading now is being given the tools to endure suffering, but not being given the tools to challenge patriarchy, which produces suffering or to challenge racism, which produces suffering or to challenge capitalism, which induce, uh, produces suffering to challenge exploitation and poverty, which produces suffering. And we have to begin to do the job of not simply providing people the tools to be able to uh, endure suffering, but begin to uh, provide people the tools to challenge that stuff, to challenge the root causes of that suffering. Okay, so please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Remember, we will be back tomorrow to start our final chapter of Sister Citizen by Melissa V. Harris Perry. We put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin or further their journey and the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. I'll holla at you tomorrow.